I tell you, this is a, it's just been so, I guess, uh, unexpected. This time last year, if you said, well, this time next year, you're going to preach to a group of people. Most of them will have a mask on. They'll be spread out. There will be, you'll be happy that you have about 80 less than you normally have. And uh, you would have just started back life groups. We would have said, what? You're crazy. A lot of things, let's just be honest, we, we don't know what to do. We don't know how to view things. And uh, it's, it's a crazy world. But I'm going to tell you, we do know some things to do, don't we? We know to pray. We know to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. And we know to stay in the Word of God. Would you open your copy of God's Word today to Daniel chapter 1? And we begin our series, Faith and Fortitude. You know, another way of saying faith and fortitude is simply stand firm. You see, faith is confidence or trust. We're standing on the promises of God. We're standing on the Word of God, the rock of Jesus Christ. We're trusting Him to hold us up. And then fortitude simply means strength. And so with firmness, with strength, with power, we're immovable upon our God. So we're going to be thinking of that theme throughout the next 12 chapters and we begin this great series and I'm praying God will bless you through it. Now I first preached a version of this message back in 1996 to a group of youth in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. So I hope the teenagers are listening today. But this type of message that quite frankly needs to be taken seriously it also needs to be taken to college by you young people when you go. We know, or maybe some don't know, that these young men and women face great enemies of the faith when they get to college. We want them to stay strong. Amen, parents? We want them to stay pure. Amen, grandparents and parents? Amen, brothers and sisters? Yes, we want them to stay God's people. Some of you moms, initially, you're just concerned, as I noticed through experience, you're just concerned about the dorm room getting clean. Like one boy whose mom was astounded at how filthy his dorm room was, he called sometime after her traumatic visit and said, Mom, don't worry, we cleaned up enough to mop the floor, and Mom, it's still sticky but at least you don't lose your socks when you walk across the floor. There were some very sweet teenagers. They're not teenagers now, but 24 years ago when I preached this and they listened well, and today I hope all of you will listen. We all need young people and old people. We all need heroes to whom we look for encouragement as an example for peace of mind. Daniel is such a hero. Look with me in Daniel verses 1 and 2 of the first chapter. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. That is, he surrounded it. He cut off the, in, in, the uh, flow of food and supplies in and out. And that's what kings would do and armies would do to get a city to surrender. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, Nebuchadnezzar's hand, with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Around 605 years before Christ, there was a long and painful defeat of the southern kingdom. Remember, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Israel, was divided. There was the northern kingdom, usually referred to as Israel, and those were the other 11 tribes. But the southern tribe, Judah, in the south, was the other part of the kingdom. And they had had different kings for many, many years by this point, ever since right after Solomon. And just imagine this scene. 
here is the city of Jerusalem, here is the tribe of Judah, and here are these young people, most scholars think, between the ages of 15 and 18, and they are kidnapped and taken to a foreign land. They're stripped away from their parents. They're stripped away from the things they know and their other friends and their schooling and all that they used to be familiar with, and they are found in the court of a king. And then he mentioned the articles from the house of God. Imagine seeing, just picture with me in your mind's eye, seeing the silver and gold items that were in the temple. And some of you know what some of those look like. There was the menorah, there were uh, chalices or cups that were used. Uh, There there were other articles to use on the altar. And just imagine they thought this is some great gold and great silver, so we're going to take it and we're going to put this in our, our church, our place of worship, only our God's better than Yahweh, this God, because look, we've won, so he must be better. And it was such a mockery. And you say, well, that, I just don't really understand now how that would apply. Well, what are the vessels of God today? Well, the Bible teaches that The building is not the temple, but the people are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so the vessels where God's Spirit dwells and what He uses in worship really are not not the instruments like this or or the stained glass like that over there and that over there, but you, you and I are the instruments. We're the vessels of the Lord. We're to be used by the Lord. And just imagine today, this is when someone who really used to be found in the service of God, in the house of God, worshiping God, reverencing God, learning all about God, and then they're found in a foreign place. And none of the familiar things, listen, young people, none of the things that used to encourage their faith are around them any longer. None of the comforts of the church and the comforts of parents and Christian friends and friends that aren't going to push you to do the wrong thing, none of those things are around. In 2 Corinthians 4, 7, Paul wrote, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. In other words, we're just like clay pots. We're just like a vessel that's fragile. It can break. There's nothing really inherently valuable or special about that vessel, except it's what's inside that's so important. And let me just tell you that wherever you find yourself, adults, teens, children, it's the Holy Spirit of God inside you that makes you who you are and makes you special and makes you valuable. But so many go out into the world and there's another corresponding principle here. God has given us some wonderful gifts that ultimately help us relate to Him. Think of the wonderful gifts God has given us. Think of the gifts of education. Think of the gift of marriage and sex. Think of the gifts, the talents that God's given you to worship Him. And think about that just for a moment uh, as I read the next verses. Look at verses 3 and following. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs. By the way, the word eunuchs there does not mean Daniel and his friends will become eunuchs. It's a general word. It can mean a eunuch but it is, it's not necessarily a eunuch, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. So there's education right there. But they say, bring, look, don't just bring anybody. But we know we took captive some of the young people that were children, that are children of the nobles, of the kings, of the important people. I mean, these are the smartest, best looking, best educated, most gifted kids. Bring them here because we want to make them into people like us. We want to teach them our culture, our language, our values. We want to trade what we know for what they know. We don't want them to think the way they used to think We want them to think in a different way. Verse 5, And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them. So this wasn't a little camp. This was three years. By the way, it's interesting. A normal master's of divinity degree 
for a pastor, which is the bread and butter degree that most pastors get, uh, that's a three-year degree. Kind of interesting there. Jesus had the disciples how long before he was crucified and raised and ascended? Say it. Three years. Very significant. Three years of brainwash, I mean training for them. But it is going to be kind of brainwashing if they're not careful. So that at the end of that time, they might serve before the king. Now, from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You might know his friends as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These are the same guys. These are their Hebrew names. To them, verse 7, the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. That is, look, I'm afraid to go tell the king that you people, y'all are our prisoners. Do you remember that, son? That you don't want to eat his food and drink his wine. You want me to go tell him that? For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? In other words, he wants to fatten you up. And this is going to be a problem. Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Ezra, please test your servants for ten days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them 10 days. Now let's stop right there. Daniel says, look, we can test it for a temporary time, 10 days, and you'll see the proof is in the pudding, we'll be fine. And so there's already an attempt to uh, make, this is not just a diet change, this is to get them to break Levitical diet laws, that's true. You say, well, it's no big deal to eat certain meats, but remember, God's law for his people was to set them apart from others. It wasn't simply for health reasons. And also, this wine probably would have been very alcoholic wine that Daniel and his friends did not drink. And so Daniel says, this is not what we want to do. And today, our young people are told on every front, get a good education, study hard, go to school, go to college. And the Bible does say in Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And so the beginning of our education ought to be, hey, there's someone we fear more than our captors, more than a king, and it is the Lord. Did you know really that was the approach of the university system many, many, many years ago? Did you know that was the approach? The charter of Yale states that liberty to erect a collegiate school is given to the trustees that, quote, youth may be instructed in the arts and sciences who through the blessing of Almighty God may be fitted, that means they may be trained and, and, and ready for public employment both in church and civil state. The charter echoes Davenport's own stated purpose for founding a college. Davenport's one of 16 colleges that make up the university system at Yale University. More poignantly, the trustees are founding ministers noted in their proceedings on November the 1st, 1701, that it was, quote, the glorious public design of our now blessed fathers, both to plant and under the divine blessing to propagate in America the pure worship of God, not only to their posterity, but also to America's native peoples. In other words, we're to, we're to promote the worship of God. But not just to our children, we're to be missionaries to the Native Americans, the people we, we found here. The trustees specify their desire to share in this gospel purpose. We, their unworthy posterity, lamenting our past neglects of this grand errand and sensible of our equal obligations, better to prosecute the same end. Our, desirous in our, or our desires in our generation 
to be serviceable thereunto, whereunto the liberal and religious education of suitable youth is under the blessing of God, a chief and most probable expedient. Now, archaisms aside with all that old language, they're saying, look, to explore, liberal doesn't mean bad and not conservative. It means to explore all of the arts and sciences and to know about God through the Bible. This is the best thing that we can do. Wow, how things have changed. Nathan Harden, who is a researcher, recently said of Yale University, quote, an unpopular political opinion is liable to launch a campus-wide protest. A profession of orthodox religious belief is liable to provoke mass meltdown. He said, today Yale is so, not so much a university as it is a safe space with a 27 billion dollar endowment. And then he asks, am I exaggerating? exaggerating? And then he responds to his own question, maybe, but not much. This here in the book of Daniel is an attempt to reprogram these young people, to erase their faith and their beliefs in their God. This is not simply changing their diet. You know, the devil wants the best of the best, doesn't he? He wants the gifted people. He wants the church kids. And here they're even changing their name. I mean, Daniel's name means God is judge. And they changed his name to Belshazzar. Bel, which was their false god, protect his life. This would have been the god of Nebuchadnezzar's father, Nabopolassar. And then... Nebuchadnezzar's God was Marduk. They changed Hananiah to Jehovah, which is Jehovah is gracious, Yahweh is gracious, to Shadrach, the command of the moon God. And Mishael, which is a name that means who is like God, to Meshach, who is like Aku, another of their false gods. Azariah, Jehovah, is my helper, to Abednego, the servant of Nego. This is right here happening where modern-day Iraq is. This is here in the Fertile Crescent. This is here in Mesopotamia. This is just north of Ur, where God called Abraham and said, come follow me to a place that I will show you. This is often called, as we saw in verse 2, the land of Shinar. It was a land of perversion. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. This was where the Tower of Babel was attempted, was built, and God had to disrupt the pagan worship of the day. This was, he listen, this was headquarters for paganism and for the devil. But what did Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, Daniel, what did they do? Well, look back at verse 8, and I want to just show you just four, four things they did, and I'll be quick. Verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Daniel purposed purity in his heart. That's what he did. We all face temptation. We all face the decision of whether to compromise our faith or not. Daniel faced temptation. He faced the temptation of pollution. The, look, this is, not, this is against what God has said for me. It was a, a temptation to put in his system things God had said to stay away from. How does that apply to us today? Do we say, well, be careful what you eat and drink? Well, maybe, but I just want to show you something a little different. Think about the reasons he could have compromised. The king commanded it. Well, we need to do what the king said. Fear of punishment. We're going to be punished if we don't do what he says. No advancement. Look, we know God will want us to be happy in this foreign land. We've been through enough. And this is God's way of helping us to have a good life even here in Babylon. They could have compromised in that way. They wouldn't want to be social outcasts. Well, we'll be the only ones on this other diet plan, Daniel. 
Who else would know or care for that matter? Look, what's in Babylon stays in Babylon. It's not like we're in Jerusalem anymore. This is what they do over here. Who's going to know we're in the king's court now? Or how about this one? Do you ever allow this to lull you into temptation? This is God's fault anyway. He allowed us to get captured. He allowed us to be put in this situation. No, this is a temptation of pollution from the devil. But Daniel purposed in his heart. That is, he made a decision immediately. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to remain pure. What is purity anyway? Purity, that great preacher Robert Murray McShane wrote to a young man named Dan Edwards upon his ordination, in great measure, according to the purity and perfections of the instrument, meaning the vessel, meaning the person, will be the success. It is not great talents God blesses so much as great likenesses to Jesus. A holy minister is an awful, and not awful as in bad, but awful as in awe-inspiring weapon. A minister who is holy is an awe-inspiring weapon in the hands of God. Two theological students were walking along a street in Whitechapel, district of London, England, and there was an old clothing store. And one turned to the other and said, what a fitting illustration all this makes, said one of the students. And he pointed to a window in which there was a a set of clothing hanging on a rack that had a sign and it said slightly soiled greatly reduced in price in other words a little bit of sin a little bit of dirt you don't think it's a big deal but it will greatly jeopardize our value of usefulness to the Lord there was the temptation of pollution there was the temptation of procrastination Daniel's there they give them the new names. They said, look, you're going you're gonna to eat a new diet. You're going to be drinking this wine. You're going to be in the king's court. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. There's the temptation of procrastination. You see, Daniel could have said, well, I'm going to wait till supper and see what it looks like. But he didn't do that. He, and see, not yielding to the lordship of Christ at the first sign of temptation is a tragic and tactical error in your fight against the devil. Immediately at the first sign of temptation, say, Jesus, your Lord, (laughs) I belong to you. I'm to be pure in Christ. Don't fall into the temptation of procrastination. Excuse me. By the way, a a good way to do this practically, let me give you some practical advice. Get, Get your journal, young people, adults, get your journal. Write out a vision statement for your life based on the Bible. Write out your mission. Write out your values. Write out key Bible verses and post them up and stare at them. Our associate pastor to families and students has this Bible verse posted in his office. And I remember some years ago us talking about this Bible verse It's found in Job 31.1. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. What a great verse for young men to post up in in the path of their vision. The rest of that says, For what is our lot from God above, our heritage from the Almighty on high? Is it not ruin for the wicked, disaster for those who do wrong? Does he not see my ways and count my every Step. See, Daniel knew that even though he was in Babylon, he was far from home, but he was not hidden from the eyes of God. He purposed purity in his heart. Then they proved themselves to the prince. Look down at verse 15. And at the end of those ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh. And this isn't fat in a bad way, y'all. This is, in other words, they had the right amount of flesh on their bones. Then all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies, thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies, meaning the other young men, and the wine that they were to drink, and gave them vegetables. The whole cafeteria plan changed because of Daniel and his friends. I mean, this is crazy, isn't it? But this is how God moves. This is how God will use you. He'll prove through you 
His virtue and His blessing. Verse 17, As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Listen, you purpose purity in your heart, and God, you listen, people may laugh at you. They may mock at you. You may seem like, hey, you may be kind of termed a country bumpkin or, or someone who's a, a fundamentalist or someone who's a, just hokey or out of touch or old school, but listen to me, God's going to be on your life. And God's presence in your life will enable you to prove to others, not to everyone, but you'll be pro- you will prove to others that your God is real. God moved in Daniel and his friends' lives. It reminds me of 1 Corinthians 10, 13 that says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Isn't that what happened right here? You know, we might entitle this wise with no compromise. D- Daniel said, we're not, we can't do this, but here's what we can do, and here's what we're willing to do, and we're willing to be tested, and we're not trying to buck your authority. They proved themselves to the prince. But here's something that's even more important than that. Not only did they purpose purity in their heart and prove themselves to the prince. Look back at verse 9. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. You know, don't miss verse 9. They pleased God. God said, I'm going to, I know you're in a foreign land. I know this is bad, but I'm still in control. And you can stand firm. And I'm going to work and I'm going to move. In a Barna teen study, George Barna does these studies. This is just from 2018, so not long ago. They asked this question, what were the differences between Christian and non-Christian Gen Zers? And one of the main findings from the study is that the problem of evil is a major barrier to faith for non-Christian teens, 29%. Why do I tell you that? Because so many people don't look through the lens of a holy, sovereign God when they encounter their lives and the problems in their lives. Let me explain further. Yes, there's evil. And yes, at times it's hard to explain. But a believer, a Christian, and this was 29% of the non-Christian young people, but Christians know that, hey, there may be evil, but God's still in control. And God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. And God Himself is certainly not the author of evil. Oh, this is amazing. Look back at verse 1. Let me show you something that you might miss. It says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. You know why that's interesting? You'll notice there that Lord is not in all caps. If you look back at the Hebrew, it's not in all caps there in the English because that's not Yahweh. That's not the covenant name for God. You'll find the covenant name for God here in this book. But here, Daniel, of course, is writing also for non-Jewish people. But this is Adonai. Have you ever heard that? Adonai. It's the Greek equivalent of Lord or Kyrios. And it, 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 he's saying to a mixed audience, there is a Lord who's in control of all. Your translation may say he delivered the kingdom. The Hebrew word there, that's what it means. It, it, it quite literally means he gave it. Who was Jehoiakim? Jehoiakim was the second son of Josiah. Before Jehoiakim, there was another king, the first son of Josiah, and he did evil. Josiah did good, but his son did evil. Pharaoh took control of this second son, Jehoiakim. He was just a patsy. That means he was just a pawn, and, and, and then all of a sudden... He is taken out of the way. And these kids are taken captive and this city falls and it's the Babylonian exile. And yet, this young man, Daniel, and his friends say, we still must please 
God. Amen? We must please God. He's in control. God, the Lord of all, allowed Nebuchadnezzar all of his power. Did you know scholars say that Nebuchadnezzar, listen, Nebuchadnezzar, boys and girls, was probably the greatest and most powerful king of all ancient times. But no match for the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Let me show you one more thing. They prophesied the word of God. Look at verses 18 through 21. Now, at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Here it is, drum roll, moment of truth, right? Then the king interviewed them. And among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. The king tested all these guys. He goes back to the chief of units. He said, let me tell you who I want. These four, that, these are better than all the other. There's no one like them. These are the ones I want at my right hand and at my left. Verse 20, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all, not just the young men, all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm, all the scholars and advisors and those who were involved in the black arts. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of the king of Cyprus. Here's the thing. When you are pure and God proves through you that he's in control, and when you are absolutely pleasing to the Lord, you'll be able to speak for the Lord. And that's what Daniel did. He prophesied the word of God. The king was convinced. And you know why the king was convinced? Because Daniel was convinced that he was going to serve God. You know, sometimes you know what you're going to be told. You need to be open-minded. I was literally told this at a Christian college you need to be more open-minded th than what you've been taught in Sunday school. By the way, if a professor says that, alarm bells ought to go off in your mind. Another professor said this, I know the Bible says this, but all the other books I've read, when someone starts a, a conversation with that, watch out. C.S. Lewis said this, an open mind in questions that are not ultimate is useful. In other words, if you're saying, well, you know, you, you might want to, um, you, you might want to uh, fix the car this way instead of, you know, instead of pulling up on ramps, you might want to put the car up on a lift or you might, in questions that don't matter, but an open mind about ultimate foundations, that is good and evil, heaven and hell, the revelation of God. These are the ultimate. Why are we here on earth? Ultimate questions. The questions that you must answer before you grow up. An open mind about these foundations, either of theoretical or practical reason, is idiocy. That means, quite frankly, it's absolutely stupid. If a man's mind is open on these things, let his mouth at least be shut. C.S. Lewis. I had an old dorm director that said, yeah, you, they tell you to have an open mind, but be careful. If you have too much of an open mind, you might have to close it for repairs. And you've heard this, don't be so open minded that your brain falls out. Listen, you be enamored, in love with, you be versed in, studied in the Word of the living God and stand firm. Stand firm on the faith with great fortitude. Daniel went on to be delivered from the lion's mouths, and the others went on to be delivered from the fiery furnace. Why did Daniel make it? Why do we see him being promoted in the pagan kingdom and prophesying about even the very end of the age, things that have even been passed and that have yet to pass? Why? Because... He purposed purity in his heart because he proved himself to the world, because he pleased God, because he prophesied the Word of God. Where are you? Where are you? You say, well, how do I do this? Well, you know, ultimately, God came to Daniel in chapter 10 and said, 
I want to show you some things. And also Daniel's, Daniel had a special angel assigned to him. We're going to study that. But Daniel describes a vision of the Son of Man, and it's very similar to what John describes in Revelation chapter 1. And let me say to you, Jesus is probably not going to appear to you physically until you die or he comes back. But as you look through the lens of the Word of God, would you pray something like we've sung this morning? Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great father, I thy true son. Thou in me dwelling and I with thee one. Be thou my battle, shield, sword for the fight. Be thou my dignity, thou my delight. Thou my soul shelter, thou my high tower. Raise thou me heavenward, O power of my power. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only, first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure thou art. High King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joy, O bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, that is whatever happens to me, you are the very center of my being, heart of my heart. Still be my vision. Still be what I fix my eyes on and my life on. O oh, ruler of all. May I ask you a question? Everyone who's in this room, everyone who's watching via live stream, everyone who will listen to this later, is he your ruler? Is Jesus Christ Lord of your life. Our instrumentalists are going to come and play. We're going to have what's called an invitation or a time to respond. And I, what I want to ask you to do is first respond in your heart. Is Jesus your Lord? You say, well, how do you make him your Lord? You realize that you're absolutely separated from God. You're absolutely unfit to be in His presence. You say, but God's love, yes. But you're still unfit to be in His presence. And He will not allow you into His presence. But God demonstrated that love toward us. In that while we were still sinners, while we were separated, while we were unlovely, while we were unfit for His presence, Christ died for us. And so God put upon Jesus all of your sin, all of my sin, and he punished Jesus. And so now he doesn't have to punish you if you will receive him as Lord of your heart, Lord of your life. You say, how do I do that? Well, it's not by works or ritual or giving money or anything like that. It's by faith. Faith and fortitude is the name of our series. What is faith? F-A-I-T-H, forsaking all, I trust Him. Lord Jesus, I can't do anything to save myself, but I trust that you died on the cross for me, and I give you my life in gratitude. Would you come in and be my king? I'm sorry for my sin. I don't want to be in charge anymore. I want you to be my king. That's how you're saved. That's how you make Him ruler of your life. That's how he becomes the vision and purpose of your life. Just bow your heads right now all over the room. Just everyone bow and pray that in your heart. God, I want you to rule my life. God, I'm a sinner and I'm so sorry, but you died to cover over my sin, to remove my sin. God's punishment went to you in my place. So I receive that gift, Lord. Just pray that, Lord, I receive that gift. Would you come into my life? and change me. Just pray that. Come into my life and change me. Save me, Lord. Just ask Him, save me, Lord. And now thank Him. Lord Jesus, thank You for saving me. Now look up here. Here's what I want to ask you to do. That was in your heart. You may have even prayed that silently in your mind. That's okay. But in the New Testament, people that followed Jesus followed Him publicly. There's never any private Christian. They identify with Him. How do they do that? Do they get a sign and go out on the street and say, I am a Christian? 
You might could do that, but that's not what we see in the Bible. Do they, do they write it on their Facebook page? Well, I don't think we see that in the Bible, but you could do that. What do they do? They identify with the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the building of God, God's garden, God's field. Those are all metaphors for the local visible church. You say, okay, pastor, I'll identify with Christ through his church. How do I do that? Well, first step, don't be ashamed. Walk forward, tell the minister, look, I, I've given my life to Jesus and I want to serve him. You don't have to stay a member of this church, but you can start here and you can identify with Jesus here through believer's baptism. And we'll help you with all that. We've got great literature. We've got stuff written by people far smarter than I and I promise you, we'll help you every step of the way if you'll ask, if you'll allow us to do it. So that's the invitation. And then others, you might say, look, I was already saved, Brother Ashley, but I want to identify with the church because I, not that I haven't done that in the past, but I need to recommit my life. Or look, I want to specifically be part of this church and I want to move my membership here. Or I need to be belong to this church and I, I've never been baptized scripturally so I'm going to do that I want you to come and then those of you who are ready you've been through the class and all and you just need to be presented I want you to come as well let's stand as I pray Lord may we allow you to do what you can do Lord I preached kind of a long sermon and there's a lot there but Lord would you just take your holy word and the fact that even when there was great tragedy and kidnapping and the fall of the promised land, Lord, that you gave your people, Lord, you were still in control. Lord, you were at work, and Lord, you always are. So today, this morning, even amidst coronavirus and social upheaval and wicked times, Lord, and uncertainty, and even our own fears, Lord, would you just allow people to respond to you. Lord, may we identify with you. May we purpose to make you the Lord of our hearts. And may people even respond publicly today. In Jesus' name we pray.